I think there are several nutrition beliefs that are quite dangerous to uh, health today. One of those is that uh, somehow our diet should be based on carbohydrate and this notion that glucose derived from carbohydrate is the predominant fuel or ought to be the predominant fuel to uh, drive our activities on a day-to-day -day basis. What we know now instead is that fat is actually the preferred human fuel. So what follows from that, uh, another um, piece of, uh, of conventional wisdom with which I disagree is this notion that fat in our diet is a bad thing. In fact, I believe that fat is necessary to a healthy human diet. Uh, I think one of the uh, uh, erroneous beliefs is that we should watch our calorie intake uh, in order to lose weight. Uh, it, it's much more complex than that. And, and the loss of weight is more about losing body fat. That's really the intention is to lose body fat, not to just lose weight. Uh, so there are a lot of myths around what it takes to achieve a level of ideal body composition uh, that are based around some formula that involves calories but doesn't necessarily look at the macronutrient ratio and in particular carbohydrate. The legacy of the food pyramid, if there is one, is not a positive one. I think the legacy of the food pyramid in, in the future will be shown to have been uh, a deleterious uh, emphasis on grains. Uh, if I were to you know, distill it to a nutshell, there are a lot of things wrong with it, but at the base of the pyramid and probably at the base of the, of the uh, felonious and erroneous assumption would be that we somehow need to have what they used to call and still do uh, in some circles heart healthy whole grains as the basis of a healthy diet. Uh, I disagree vehemently with that, and I think that uh, we're just now beginning to see some of the results of uh, uh, individuals who've gotten very sick by adhering to this food pyramid and basing their dietary plans around 6 to 11 servings of grains on a daily basis. Uh, it's interesting how the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture continues to um, believe that they need to play a role in our health, uh, in our decision making, and so they've, uh, they've updated the food pyramid from a triangle to a circle and called it my plate, uh, when in fact it's pretty much the same advice uh, spun slightly differently. I arrived at my, my current uh, ideology and belief system as it applies to my uh, diet and my exercise pattern, for that matter, based on a prior history being in a, a top endurance athlete. So I was a marathoner in the 70s and early part of the 80s, and then I was an uh, endurance triathlete. I did Ironman. Uh, the, the irony was that I was assuming that I was doing all of these things to enhance my health. So I was putting in a lot of miles, and I was fueling those miles with the uh, assumed best fuel of the day, which was carbohydrates. I was carbo-loading, uh, not just before races, but uh, essentially as an elite athlete, you carbo-load every day in preparation for the next day's challenge or the next day's workout. Uh, so I was taking in probably 1,000 grams of carbs on a daily basis. Uh, I became very race fit, uh, and I uh, you know, was on the cover of Runner's World magazine three times, and I had... Uh, for, for all intents and purposes, I was the picture, literally and figuratively, of fitness, but not of health. And uh, while I could perform well, on the inside I was falling apart. I had osteoarthritis, I had uh, irritable bowel syndrome that uh, would not resolve, I had upper respiratory tract infections uh, multiple times a year uh, that would linger, uh, chronic sinus infections, uh, I had heartburn uh, more often than a young person ought to have. And all of these things combined uh, with the fact that I was putting in a lot of miles and getting injured on a regular basis sort of turned a light bulb on in my head in my late 20s. And uh, I realized that while I had gone into this initially in a pursuit of health, not in the pursuit of fitness and, and performance necessarily, but strictly in the pursuit of health from a very young age, I had become the antithesis of health, uh, which sort of uh, led me on this 30-year journey that I've been on to identify all of the factors that it takes 
to be both healthy and fit with the least amount of pain and suffering and sacrifice. Uh, and as a result of the investigations that I did, I discovered quite early that, uh, that I think humans ought to be deriving most of their energy from their stored body fat and not from refilling their glycogen uh, and, and re-upping their glucose intake every three hours throughout the day. That was a very uh, big epiphany for me, uh, which ultimately has led to my creation of a style of eating uh, or lifestyle called the Primal Blueprint and the, the dietary component of which really revolves around eating whole natural foods but eliminating grains, processed uh, carbs, sugars for sure, certain types of industrial seed oils and you arrive at a diet that's largely uh, meat, fish, fowl, eggs, nuts, seeds, vegetables, a little bit of fruit uh, and is uh, quite allowing of uh, eating at what we say ad libitum as much as you want when you want but one of the side effects of that, of reducing the, the, the processed carbohydrate intake, is that your appetite sort of um, finds its, its real level at which you can maintain an ideal body composition and not have to agonize and count calories and worry about, am I eating enough or am I eating too much? It's a very freeing and empowering kind of lifestyle, which, again, back to the original component, is based around uh, largely controlling your carbohydrate intake and limiting your carb intake to just those that are found in vegetables and some fruits and, and other uh, natural forms. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, this is a complex um, um, discussion, this idea of carb loading, because it really, it does revolve initially around uh, a term that was invented for endurance athletes who would refill their glycogen stores massively um, on the eve of a big event. Uh, that concept somehow translated into the general population and, and no longer applied necessarily to elite athletes, but to apply to everybody who was a weekend warrior. And there was a discussion about, uh, again, carbs being the, the, the primary fuel to fuel any athletic uh, activity, whatever the level of, of play was. Um, we have to go back to our, our uh, evolution, our ancestry, and for two and a half million years the average human had access to about a hundred grams of carbs a day, most of which was locked in a very tight fibrous matrix, so it had a very low glycemic index. There was not this ability to carbohydrate load. There was not even this ability to go out and, and perform at a high level of uh, aerobic capacity on multiple days in a row. It was just uh, antithetical, again, to survival. If you exhausted your glycogen stores as a result of chasing after a beast one day, it was going to be very difficult to do that same thing the next day. Um, it would have been perverse to think about going out as a, as a hunter-gatherer and just running a 10K just for sport. It was, it was until the advent of grains and the ability to replenish our carbohydrate, our glycogen stores with cheap, cheap calories that uh, readily convert to glucose on a daily basis, it was just unheard of to even think about that. So our systems have been evolving over two and a half million years not to carbo-load but to depend uh, largely on fats and, and in, in periods of starvation or at least uh, minimal food intake uh, to supply the brain with fuel through ketones and not to rely so heavily on glucose. Um, we have uh, adapted to this lifestyle and the technology and civilization and all of the accoutrements of uh, our modern, civilized, convenient, comfortable society by having access to an unlimited supply of carbohydrates and since we uh, our, our brains are attuned to seeking out carbs because they were so scarce millions of years ago. Uh, we still sort of have that wiring in there somewhere. Meanwhile, we have access, again, to these uh, unlimited supplies, and we tend to overdo the carb intake. It's just too easy. It, it smells too good to walk by a, uh, you know, a pretzel factory or a cinnamon roll place or a, a pasta place and, and, and not partake because it's, it's cheap, it's readily available at, at all times. So we've, um, we've, we've gone down this road where we now uh, kind of live our lifestyles around the mantra of the 90s and 80s which was we ought to be eating small meals, multiple small meals throughout the day to keep our blood sugar up because if we don't then we'll go into starvation mode and we'll start to cannibalize our muscle tissue and all of this, this host of potential negative catabolic consequences that could happen 
simply as a result of, a de of an unnatural and unnecessary dependence on carbohydrate intake and glucose as a fuel. Well, in my research, and, and it's now being confirmed, and, and I'm the first one to say it, there have been others who have said this, but uh, the, the term we use is 80% of your body composition is determined by how you eat. The other 20% can be affected by what you do in the gym. The corollary to that is you can't, you can't work out to fix a bad diet. You know, you can't uh, exercise away bad di dietary choices. So going to the gym is certainly a, uh, an important component of being healthy and fit. But the, the major factor in all of this is getting the diet to the point where you are, uh, you've arrived at an ideal body composition with or without the exercise. And that happens as a result of you literally reconfiguring your enzyme systems to derive most of your energy from your stored body fat or from the fat in a meal, as opposed to depending uh, from meal to meal on a fresh supply of glucose or carbohydrate. When you tap into this, what we call, uh, when you become a fat-burning beast, and you tap into this power that we all have, it's in everyone's DNA, it's in your genetic recipe. All it requires is certain inputs to affect how the genes express themselves when they rebuild and repair and renew you on a daily basis. And at some point through the diet, you arrive at a, at a, at a, um, a metabolic level where you can derive, again, most of your energy from your stored body fat and so you skip a meal, you don't have low blood sugar, you don't have mood or depression issues, uh, your performance at work doesn't suffer, and in fact, your body is very happy to take the saturated fat that it's stored on the hips or the belly or the, uh, under the arms or wherever your problem areas are. It's happy to take that fat and use that as fuel instead of uh, directly off a plate. A typical complaint about this way of eating is that it's too expensive to eat healthy. Um, you know, people are on uh, limited budgets these days. They're aware of uh, all of the other costs in life. And uh, my first response is it's very expensive to be sick. And if you look at our national health budget, you'll see that over a trillion dollars is spent every year on end of life care. Uh, just sort of taking care of people while they're suffering from the, the vagaries and the, and the missteps of the, uh, the prior, you know, decades. This is a big issue, and I, I tell people, you have a 401k that may or may not be growing in its, uh, you know, given the, the uh, level of returns that are available in the, in the general marketplace right now. There's a much greater rate of return that's available by investing in your health now and then not having to tap into that 401k for the $250,000 that wasn't covered by, by health insurance. Now, whether or not future insurance programs are going to account for that, the reality is that if you get rid of the packaged, pretty uh, food dyed and colored cereals and all of the things that are, that uh, not only contain uh, processed grains and dyes and sugars, but also reflect a tremendous amount of advertising that had to go into getting them on the store shelf and, and getting them in your, in your line of sight. Uh, you pay a lot of money for that stuff, and if you were able to uh, excise those from your budget and just focus on, on wholesome, natural foods, it's not that expensive. Well, the changes that I see uh, are, are uh, largely through my own filters, which have to do with the paleo movement and my particular uh, uh, brand within that, the Primal Blueprint, which is a lifestyle that revolves around sort of finding out uh, all of these hidden genetic switches uh, that we can uncover through modern genetic science and peering back at evolutionary biology and kind of, if you will, hacking uh, the human biology to figure out, again, what, what are the best choices that I can make with food, uh, that I can make with my activity levels that allow me to become as healthy as I possibly can be, to optimize my energy levels, uh, to be productive at work, to be um, productive in a, in a relationship and be in a loving relationship and all of the things that we say we want. Uh, and what I see is a grassroots movement that uh, is, is very effective because it largely uh, moves from person to person now based on 
um, results, visible results. Somebody will come up to somebody else and say, wow, you've lost 75 pounds. How did you do that? And the answer isn't one of the typical programs. It's not Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or well, it's, you know, I, I started eating healthy fats. I cut out the carbs to a certain extent and you don't have to cut out all carbs. Um, I started working out less, uh, but, but smarter. Uh, and I've, you know, arrived at this lifestyle and I've arrived at this lifestyle that's not only uh, effective, but it's sustainable. I know I can do this for the rest of my life. And that's really uh, probably the key component to all of this, is that when you, when you are able to tap into this vast power that we all have, to access the power of your genetic recipe, to become an efficient fat-burning beast, to build muscle instead of worrying about losing it all the time because of, of um, being injured or sick, uh, to have the energy to get through the day. It's, it's one of the most empowering feelings, and I see it carrying over into other areas of people's lives. If, if I don't have to cede control of my health to my doctor or to some insurance company or to some national health program, if I can take full responsibility and control of my own health and see the results there, then what else can I do in other areas of my life? How can I apply that to my business or my, my employer-employee relationship? How can I apply those same principles to my family? This is really where we're seeing this head. It's, it really transcends just the diet portion. The most important piece of advice I could give to anybody as a starting point for healthy eating would be cut out the sugars. It's that simple. Cut out the sugary drinks uh, and the desserts, and you are well on your way to, uh, you know, to trending in the right direction. Awesome. Very nice. Okay. Counting calories doesn't work in and of itself as a model for weight loss or weight reduction or even fat loss, for that matter. Uh, calories have context. So... Protein calories have a slightly different context from fat calories or from carbohydrate calories. Uh, by that I mean that some amount of protein that you consume isn't going to be directed toward energy production, even though we assign a caloric value to it of four calories per gram. Much of the protein that you take in is going to repair, repair muscle tissue or to be involved in, in, in some other uh, transport chain. Uh, Similarly, some of the fats that you take in aren't necessarily going to be burned immediately for energy. They might be incorporated into the cells. So just looking at the caloric content of a diet by itself is a little bit of an uh, you know, a, a inappropriate way of, of addressing a very important issue, which is that of what, what it's going to take for me to lose weight, uh, or in this case, lose body fat. More importantly is to look at the, I think, the hormonal influence of every bite of food you take. You know, how does this affect the insulin, the glucagon, the leptin, uh, all of the counter-regulatory hormones? And, and it's all these hormones that determine whether we burn fat or store fat. So rather than addressing this as a sort of calories in, calories out equation, I prefer to think of it as a calories burned versus calories stored equation. And what are we doing when we take these calories in uh, how are we storing them? Are we burning them? What's happening to them? And that again becomes a very uh, intricate hormonal game, a symphony if you will, uh, as to uh, w where these calories go and how they're directed. It, it, there's a there's an under or a misnomer, uh, a misunderstanding if you will, that 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 uh, you know all carbohydrates are the same. And in fact, that's not the case. Uh, carbohydrates take different forms. There are low glycemic index carbs that burn slowly, that enter the bloodstream slowly. There are high glycemic index carbs that convert to glucose rapidly and cause an increase in insulin. Uh, fructose is a, is a form of, of sugars or carbohydrates that takes a different pathway from glucose. Uh, in some contexts, the intake of fructose is very beneficial for athletes, for instance, who are looking to replenish uh, liver glycogen after a workout or muscle glycogen even after a hard workout. Uh, fruits 
and fructose are probably a good option. For somebody trying to lose weight, fruit is not your friend. Fructose, because of its different pathway, if your glycogen stores are already full, fructose becomes triglycerides very rapidly and becomes uh, enters the a fat storage pathway more readily. So there are lots of different ways to look at carbohydrates, and it's not necessarily with the eye that all carbohydrates are either good or bad. They all have context. Uh, so some people will say, look, I'm, uh, I'm genetically predisposed to my, my type 2 diabetes or my obesity. Uh, it runs in my family. Uh, and the answer to, that I have for them is typically, yeah, it runs in your family all the way back 10,000 generations. We are genetically all predisposed to type 2 diabetes or obesity or metabolic syndrome if we eat the wrong things. That's how our genetic recipe works. Uh, it is incumbent upon us to identify those types of foods that don't turn those genes on. Now it is true that some people are more genetically predisposed as a result of their immediate uh, heritage or lineage. Uh, and for those people I say, you, just more than most, really have to watch what you eat. Some of us can get away with a little bit more. That doesn't make it right or wrong. But there is that um, genetic predisposition. On the other hand, Everyone has the ability to avoid getting type 2 diabetes or becoming obese based, again, on food choices, uh, exercise patterns, sun exposure, the amount of sleep you get, and a lot of other factors. So uh, none of us are really doomed as a result of our genetic heritage. Very nice. Thank you. Well, you know, my initial experience with cholesterol was, I think, typical of everybody. Uh, cholesterol is bad and you have to avoid it in the diet, and you have to make sure that you keep your own blood cholesterol levels low. Uh, I found out through the research, which is quite prevalent now, that cholesterol is not the proximate cause of heart disease, that, that cholesterol by itself is probably one of the most important molecules in the body. The body makes 1,200 to 1,400 milligrams a day on its own, whether or not you take in dietary cholesterol. Uh, so it becomes one of these uh, again, an, an irony of modern medicine that, that you would vilify one of the body's most important molecules uh, because you've attached to it some, uh, some argument that has no relevance to the reality of, of the proximate cause of heart disease, which is inflammation and oxidation. Yes, you'll find that, that uh, cholesterol is involved in that, but indicting cholesterol is like saying, you know, Band-Aids are responsible for cuts because you, wherever you see a cut, there's a Band-Aid. What we're seeing now is a real, uh, I think, a paradigm shift. Even the people who for years were saying we ought to carb load in the context of endurance performance uh, are changing their minds. Uh, most notably, I think, sort of the godfather of carb loading, Tim Noakes, uh, was brave enough after decades of going down this research path that uh, continued to promote the, the glycogen-dependent, glucose-dependent endurance athlete kind of had an epiphany and, and was brave enough to say, wait a minute, you know, maybe we've been uh, making the wrong assumptions. Uh, and, and he has now altered his opinion on, on the relative importance of glucose and glycogen uh, versus fat and ketones in athletic performance, for instance. Uh, I think that's the tip of the iceberg. We're going to see a lot more of this. And it's really, uh, again, uh, the scientific community tends to not to want to reverse their opinions because there's so much invested in the work that's gone before them. But when they do uh, reverse their opinions, it's quite profound, and that's what's happening now. Awesome. Very nice. Well said.